Thank you for taking time to allow me to come into your home or office uh, today. I'm Pastor Steve Altide from Park Street Christian Church in El Dorado Springs, Missouri. And this is our morning uh, message for the 4th of February, 2024. This is part four of five in a series on the end times entitled Keeping Watch. And this message is entitled, How Can I Be Ready? Our primary text is Matthew chapter 24 and 25, but we're also going to be looking at Daniel chapter 12, Revelation chapters 11 to 13, 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5, among a few other references, but mostly in Matthew 24 and 25, if you want to find that. Let's pray as we get started. Father, thank you for this opportunity to look at your word together. I pray that it's beneficial and fruitful for someone in your kingdom um, and that you'll use it to touch a life that will echo into eternity in your time. Uh, I pray the ripple effect would bring you honor and glory uh, as you desire in your time again by the power of the Holy Spirit and your, your word, your spoken word that we have recorded for us. Thank you for all those you've worked through that we have the scriptures like we do today in various formats, digital, print, uh, so many resources you've blessed us with. Thank you for the responsibility that comes with those blessings of sharing those with others. So I pray that as I share this with others that they in turn will be able to do that as well. Uh, Father, thank you for your amazing grace and goodness and again for your Salvation, the hope we have in Jesus, your Son, and in Him alone. And in Him, through Him, I pray. Amen. So I would encourage you to take some time to like and subscribe to our channel. That will help as we move forward today. You probably remember when this happened back a few years ago. It was, I think, in 2018, 2018, just a few years ago. There was an alert sent to the people in Hawaii, you remember this, telling them that there was an incoming ballistic missile. And it was a Saturday morning, Saturday morning like any other morning. There were some tourists waking up and getting ready to hit the beach. There were some people waking up early Saturday morning, a little bit hungry from Friday night. Some parents getting up, getting their kids around, ready to go to the soccer game. Some of those parents get ready to get their kids off to a soccer game, a little bit hungover from Friday night. There were people doing all kinds of normal things, scrolling through their phones, checking their email and text messages. Uh, just a lot of people doing a lot of different things, thinking about all kinds of things, but not thinking about the end of their life and the end of this world, when suddenly an alert popped up on their phone. You remember this? This is a screenshot of the actual alert ballistic emergency alert ballistic missile threat inbound to hawaii seek immediate shelter and in case you know somebody might not take this seriously it said this is not a drill so this was an actual alert that popped up on people's phones ballistic missile threat inbound to hawaii seek shelter immediately and for 38 minutes scores of people Hundreds of thousands of people were focused very much on preparing themselves for the end of their earthly lives. For 38 minutes, things that really mattered, really mattered. For 38 minutes, they had some clarity about what was most important in life. For 38 minutes, they began to ask themselves what was most important and ask themselves some questions about their existence and their time they'd had on earth. And I read this article that tracks some of the text messages that went back and forth during those 38 minutes before they found out that this was a mistake, it was a computer glitch and not an actual alert. I mean, it was a real alert, but it had been erroneously sent. But there was a lot of I love you's, a lot of please forgive me's, lots of trying to make some things right that needed to be made right. Messages went out to alienated family members. A lot of people panicking, of course. Lots of people trying to control things they had absolutely no control over. But lots of people confessing and many people repenting. Lots of people, lots of people praying. For 38 minutes, they had their eye in the sky. What was going to happen, where it was going to hit, it could be any moment. 
So for 38 minutes, they asked themselves, because again, they were not told how long they had before it was to hit. I mean, it could be any second. But they were asking themselves a number of serious questions, like what kind of impact have I had with my life? How am I going to be remembered? Um, what conversations do I need to have as soon as possible here that I've not taken time to, to have? What decisions do I need to make right now? Am I right with God? Am I ready for what comes after my last heartbeat? Questions that need to be answered. Because for all they knew, seriously, the time was short. And so today we're continuing in our series on the end times called Keeping Watch. And it's with that spirit that I want us to approach this whole series, this spiritual alertness. This recognition that we don't know how much time we have left on earth. So we want to ask ourselves hard but important questions. We don't want to be lulled into spiritual sleepiness where we don't think about what really matters. And we don't stop and consider that today could be the very day, the moment arrives we stand before God. In Matthew 24, there is this phrase, keep watch that's found. The disciples come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, talk to us about what is going on. When is this going to happen that you've told us about when we're going to see the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple and the end of the world? Now, they kind of ask ask it as one question because in their minds, they, they can't envision the fall of Jerusalem and destruction of the temple there without it being the end of the world. So Jesus answers both of their questions but we're not really sure in the text in Matthew 24 and 25, especially chapter 24, what parts of Jesus' answers applies to the fall of Jerusalem and which part falls to answering the question about the end of the world or his return. So Jesus makes this statement, Matthew 24, he says this in verse 42. Matthew 24, verse 42. So you too must keep watch, for you don't know that what day your Lord is coming. Now, there are those who say, well, do you see that? Notice that? Jesus said it's not for you to know the day or the hour, but he didn't say that it's not for you to know the month or the year, as if Jesus has nothing better to do than play these word games and try to give us a riddle to solve. That's not what's happening. No, it's really not for you and me to know the day, the hour, he's coming back. But instead, Jesus wants his followers to live with this continual state of awareness. That's my first main point. Jesus wants his followers to live with this continual state of awareness. He does make that clear in Matthew 24, leading up to his return. There's going to be birth pains. There will be some disasters and some suffering, some challenges and struggles. Sometimes this word, uh, for eschatology, the study in times is called tribulation. It just means pain, suffering, trouble. Jesus speaks of great tribulation or specifically what he calls in Matthew 24, verse 15 and 16, the abomination that causes or it's of desolation. Abomination that causes or it's of desolation. That's how it's worded in the New American Standard Bible, the English Standard Version, or the NIV. Well, what is that? Well, there's lots of speculation that's taken place over the years what Jesus is talking about, the abomination that causes or is of desolation. I think at least in part it would be fulfilled in the fall of Jerusalem and in uh, the coming few years when after Jesus said this, and we know that happened in Jerusalem in 70 AD. Jerusalem was leveled, this, this, the temple was destroyed. But what does Jesus mean by that? Well, he gives us a little clue where he says Daniel talks about this, okay? So you flip back to the Old Testament prophet Daniel, ver, chapter 12, verse 1. He talks about the end times being a time of distress in a way that this world has never seen before. Daniel 12, verse 1 and following. From the New Living Translation, it says, At that time, Michael, the archangel, who stands guard over your nation, will rise. Then there will be a time of anguish greater than any since nations first came into existence. 
But at that time, every one of your people whose names is written in the book will be rescued. Many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. Verse 3 says, Those who are wise will shine as bright as the skies. Those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. But you, Daniel, keep this prophecy a secret. Seal up the book until the time of the end when many will rush here and there and, acknowledge, and knowledge will increase. So what's verse 4 mean there? It means, Daniel, there's a lot of things here that can't be understood until it happens. In the end, you'll look back and see what I'm telling you now, and you'll, you'll have understanding about it. But until then, it's not going to be very clear. It's not going to be completely understood until it's completely revealed. And then it will. So Daniel goes on to describe events that will unfold one after the other, each of them lasting uh, in the neighborhood of three and a half years. The second half of that seven-year span would be time of great suffering, Revelation 11 and chapters 11 and chapter 13 describe this as a time of 42 months or again seven and a half years, three, three and a half years. And during this time, lots of people will turn to Jesus as a Savior. That especially in Israel, there will be widespread calling on Jesus as Messiah, as their Savior. Now, we talked about this a little bit last Sunday, the last Sunday of February, or excuse me, of January, about how some, how there's going to be different, there are a lot of different views about the rapture, even though that term is not used precisely in the Bible as it relates to a time of tribulation. So, we have mentioned there are some people who have different views about the rapture. It's going to take place what they call pre-tribulation or pre-trib. Some believe it's going to happen mid-tribulation or uh, mid-trib. And others who believe that, that this rapture is going to happen post-tribulation or post-trib. And I've heard this past week from people who represent all three of those views. But what's true is, it's not necessarily for us to know some of these things. What is true is there are some people who believe that Jesus talks about tribulation, that really he's talking about here, birth pains and increased in intensity and frequency, and the number seven in the Bible means completion or to the full, and that when the suffering of this world is full, complete, when there's enough. Jesus comes back as noted in Revelation and says, no more death, no more suffering, no more pain, then it'll be over. And there's a lot of different perspectives about this. Now, I'm not going to tell you exactly what I believe is going to, going to happen. Um, because again, I respect a lot of different views though I don't agree with all of them. I have stated that the Left Behind book series and the views of Tim LaHaye, Jerry Jenkins, um, you know, they wrote those books, that book series, as novels, okay? They were not necessarily Bible study books, okay? They've been turned into that by a lot of people, but they write, wrote those books as novels. What are books written as novels for? Well, to sell books, Okay, that was their goal, right in that series, about what the end of the world could look like and the ushering of Christians into eternity. Now, I don't believe a lot of the way they present things. I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, but I don't know exactly how it's all going to work out, but I know God's in charge, and we're going to love it. If you're in Christ, it's going to be okay. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul talks about the return of Jesus and what would, could, could be referred to there as a rapture. But it's not a silent, secret rapture at all. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17, Paul says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we'll be with the Lord forever. Now, the way I see it is that happens simultaneously. That happens all at once. It's not 
a spaced out large gap of time in between the dead being raised and and the those who are alive joining the Lord in the air. I think it happens all at once. But regardless, God's in charge. It's going to take place as he says, when he says it's time. And we're to be prepared. So it's not necessarily for you and me to know the when or the how. And yet, as I talked about a little bit last week, people have always tried to predict this. One of those times I remember crystal clear was back in 1988. Edgar Wisnett, a former NASA rocket scientist turned rocket engineer turned prophecy expert, wrote a booklet that contained two short works, two booklets combined into one. The first was 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. And the second one was On Borrowed Time. And he cited reasons why Christ was going to return October 8, 1988. Some of you might remember that. It made national news. It made a lot of news. It got a lot of attention. And on that very evening, it was during my first church that I was actually a preacher at. I was part-time with this small country church near my home, southeast Iowa. And we, as it worked out, were having a revival services through that week on that night, October 8th, 1988. And again, it's fresh in everybody's thinking. Because it's been in the news, okay? It was predicted that night, that, that day, sometime, that day or night, October 8th, 1988, Jesus was going to come back. Rapture was supposed to take place. And we came out from church that night after the service concluded, and I kid you not, there was a barn on fire to the east of where we were located by probably half a mile to a mile at least, but you can see it very clearly, a large barn on fire burning to the ground huge orange flames and there was a lady who came outside the service and saw that and was was seriously spooked i mean she was about to come to pieces and i just made the comment well that's not jesus coming but when jesus comes it's going to be a lot bigger than even that you know but it was just ironic that that happened when it did the timing that it was couldn't have been planned any better it was just an interesting occurrence that happened on that date, but Jesus did not come back October 8th, 1988. Now, there's been scores of predictions, right? And Jesus said, it's not for us to know the day or the hour. And Daniel emphasizes that there's going to be some things that just won't make sense until the end. And yet, our tendency is to get very much caught up in potential interpretations and eschatological views about the end times. Paul's really interesting in 1 Thessalonians 5 when he talks to the church in Thessalonica. He's addressing people in the church who had questions about their loved ones who had become Christians and then die, they died and Jesus had not returned yet. And they're concerned about the state of their loved ones. Okay, and a very high number of believers were experiencing persecution. A high number of believers were ex expecting the second coming of Jesus in their lifetime. And Paul talks to them about the return of Jesus in part because there was this false teaching claiming that he had already come back. And they'd missed it. And Paul wanted to reassure them they had not missed it. And he wanted to give them hope about those who had died in Christ. And you can understand why. Yeah, here's what he says after talking to them about the return of Jesus in chapter 4. He says, now concerning how and when, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, New Living Translation. Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you, for you know quite well that that day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. So Paul says, look, we're not going to get caught up in discussing the how. We're not going to get overly concerned about the when. Yet, over and over again. That's what we're drawn to. That's the main emphasis of our conversations about the end times, time and time again. But I want us to have the same emphasis that Jesus seemed to have in Matthew 24 when the disciples asked him about how and when. What Jesus doesn't do is say, okay, I'm so glad you asked. I've actually got a chart here that I want to go over with you. He doesn't say, here's a timetable and here's some speculative graphs about my return. He doesn't say, uh, let me give you a crash course in numerical symbolism. It, when it comes down to it, verse 42, it says, you must keep watch. Or you don't know 
Because you don't know the day, you don't know the hour the Lord is coming. And the phrase keep watch is in the present imperative tense, meaning it's a constant eye to the sky, the constant posture of readiness, of alertness. Because you don't know, so keep watch. Today could be the day. That was the message of Jesus to his followers in the first century. And that's his message today. So Jesus drives home this message, reinforces the need for awareness and preparation in the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. He does this by telling them some parables. And the first of these is not often taught on, but I want us to focus on it today. It's referred to as the parable of the ten virgins, the NLT, the New Living Translation, translates it as the parable of the ten bridesmaids, and so we're going to go with that. And what is helpful in understanding this parable is that the image of the return of Christ in Scripture is Jesus as the groom, one day returning for his bride, which is the church. We see that repeatedly in the New Testament. So keep that in mind as we look at Matthew 25, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. So just some cultural notes from Jewish weddings in the first century. In those days, bridesmaids before the wedding would go out and hang out with the bride for a length of time. They would have these lamps. And the idea was they would hang out until the word came, the groom was on his way, and they would go out to meet him, to light the path, to escort him, to come and receive his bride. That was the job of the bridesmaids, to be ready to welcome the groom. And if it was nighttime, to have their lamps ready to go, to go out and light the path. And they didn't know when he was going to come. That was part of the fun of the whole process. Okay, part of the excitement, anticipation. So the bridesmaids are to have their lamps ready to go and keep watch and be ready for the groom. And when the groom's on his way, they were to light the way at night. And it says, five of these bridesmaids here, Matthew 25, are foolish. Five of them were wise. Which seems to me to be about right. You got ten bridesmaids, 50% might be wise, 50% probably going to be foolish. And the five who are foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps. And so in verse 2, they didn't have enough. We don't know why they didn't have enough. Maybe they just got distracted with all the other wedding festivities, didn't bring enough to begin with. But they underestimated the amount of time it was going to take for the room to come, somehow. But five were prepared, five were not. We really don't know for sure why. But the other five, the wise five, were wise enough to have the extra oil on hand, and when the bride's groom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, there was a shout that roused them. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. And all the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps, but the five foolish ones said to the others, we don't have enough oil. Please give us a little bit so that we have enough. Give us some of your oil, because our lamps are not going to, they're going to go out here pretty quick. We don't have enough oil. And you can kind of hear the fear and, and panic in their voice. The groom's on his way now. So the big moment has come. They had one job to do, to go meet the groom and light the way for him to receive his bride, but they're not ready. And verse 9, the wise bridesmaid said, we don't have enough oil for all of us, us and you too. So go to the store and get, buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the groom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. And later in verse 11, when the other bridesmaids returned, the foolish ones, when they make it back, they stood outside and calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. And he called back, Believe me, I don't know you. And then Jesus concludes the account by echoing the same thing. He says in verse that he did in chapter 24, here in Matthew 25, verse 13, So you must keep watch, for you don't know the day or the hour of my return. So understand here, the problem with this parable is not the groom's punctuality. It's a lack of preparation on behalf of the foolish bridesmaids. And Jesus looked. 
You just need to know that it's not. That's how it's going to be when I come back. There are going to be people who think they're ready and they're not ready. There are going to be people who are hanging out at the wedding party and you think, well, they're ready for the groom and they're not ready for the groom. There are going to be people who have this outward appearance of readiness, but <clears throat> if you saw them, you say, oh yeah, they're ready. If you look at their social media feed, you think, oh yep, yep, they're ready. But they're not ready. And Jesus said, so it'll be on the day when I return. There's just something about temporary distractions of this life, temporary trappings that keep us from asking the questions that need to be asked to assure that we're ready. Because we're not going to get an emergency alert on our phone that Jesus is on his way. Now, to be honest with you, this is one of the more deeper theological truths that I've understood over the years that was taught to me by not a preacher in a church auditorium, sanctuary. It was not taught to me by a professor in the classroom or an expert guest speaker at a conference. It was taught to me by an inmate behind bars. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to preach a few times in a relatively new medium security prison in East Central Arkansas, close to where I was preaching, living at the time. And I had the opportunity to partner with the chaplain of the prison and he spoke to our ministerial alliance in our town and so a number of different churches went together and raised the money to purchase a portable baptistry and i contacted a ministry in joplin missouri a uh, arm american rehabilitation ministries that specialized and still does in ministry to people in prison with literature and teaching materials and classes and stuff, but also they developed a way that was a manufacturing process for something that looked like a communion table, and yet it was hollowed out with a fiberglass shell, and the top could be removed from the tank, and then you would put steps up to it, and you could use it as a baptistry. So it had a dual purpose. Served as a communion table, but it was also a uh, baptistry. And these are in jails and prisons all throughout the country, all throughout the United States and probably other countries. But we helped raise the money, and I was there that day that was delivered and filled for the first time in that prison. And I had the privilege, there was 37 prisoners who were ready to be immersed, to be baptized in accordance with biblical teaching. And I had the opportunity to baptize, I think I baptized six that day of these prisoners. But in the process of over the months of ministry there, this prisoner, this one individual prisoner one, one time after I got done preaching, came up to me, began to explain to me that one of the worst things that ever happened to him in life is to be sentenced to prison, but it was one of the best things in his life that ever happened to him because that's how he met Jesus. And he said that until everything was stripped from him, he just didn't see things clearly. He didn't understand that the purpose of his life, of this life, is to prepare for the one to come. And the way he put it was he'd never experienced freedom until he got put in prison. And he talked to me about that moment, uh, understanding that, that it's not about impressing other people like he thought it was. It's not. It's not about the next promotion. It's not about the car or the truck that you drive or the house that you live in. He just said, I didn't realize that until those things were stripped away from me. Then I saw things clearly, finally. And there he stood in his prison uniform, explaining to me that it's not about the clothes you wear. It's about making sure that you use every moment in this life to prepare for the next. And now, if you didn't know the situation, didn't know him, you might take a look at him from the outside looking in and thought, well, he's not ready. And he was ready. He was ready. And you might look around on a day like today in church, in a church service, and see certain people assume they're ready, but Jesus says someday you'll, you'll see that there's going to be a lot of people who are not ready. And it's not always going to go the way you think it's going to go. They have their lamps, but they don't have any oil in their lamps. It's this idea that you can have religion, but get used to the feeling of religion, but it's not enough that you don't have a relationship with the living Lord Jesus. It's a lamp without oil. 
the idea you come to church every weekend, you're hanging out with a wedding party, but you're not really following Jesus with your life. The idea that you can say, I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm a Christian, but your faith is just like if you got a, a chest of dresser, a dresser drawers, a chest of drawers. Say there's five different dresser drawers in that dresser. And your faith is just kind of one of those drawers. But you got your private life, your personal relationships, your vocation, your all the different things in your life are represented by different shelves of that dresser, drawers of that dresser, and your faith is just one of those different shelves. And that's not the way we see it. Our life is to be, our faith is the whole dresser. And all the different parts of our life are re reordered through the biblical worldview of Scripture, and everything that we see in life is affected by that biblical worldview. And we don't sep separate or have um, different segments of our life and our our relationship with Jesus, our, our, our um, church membership is just one of those drawers. No, it's a relationship with Jesus that affects every drawer. It's all-encompassing. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He didn't get part of our life, one segment of our life. He is over it all. He's in charge of it all. So in this account, Matthew 25, it ought to help focus us on what really matters because you can be a lamp without oil. You can be the one person in the group at your church that knows the most about end times, love to talk about millennial views and debates about the end times, but the question is, do you have some part of your life that you've not surrendered over to Jesus? If so, it's like having a lamp without any oil. It's interesting in this account that we read about that all ten bridesmaids fell asleep. In other words, it wasn't just the foolish ones, it was the wise ones as well. And it seems a little bit surprising when you think the point of this parable is not to fall asleep spiritually. That's not really it, uh, to stay spiritually alert. But it's... If that's the case, then why would the wise bride, bridesmaids have fallen asleep as well? I think that because in this parable, perhaps that falling asleep is a euphemism for death. Because it's a, a euphemism for death all through the New Testament. That death is often described as, as, as sleeping. And I think the point being made here is that you have to prepare for the groom's return before you go to sleep. Before you die. The wise bridesmaids were prepared before they went to sleep, before they died. The foolish bridesmaids were not. They were called foolish, meaning they weren't necessarily bad individuals. They were called foolish, not necessarily bad. They weren't called evil, bad people. If you saw them on the street, you'd think there wasn't any difference between them and the wise bridesmaids, perhaps. But they were foolish because they said, well, we meant to be ready. And you see those kind of people all the time who say things like, well, you know, I didn't mean to do that. I, I was going to do this, but I just haven't got around to it yet. I just need a little bit more time. I just hadn't gotten around to making that decision. I was thinking about it, but I hadn't made it yet. Uh, and they just put it off. And so they think, foolish people think they have more time than they do, and they don't know how much time they have, but it is going to run out, and time is going to be up sometime, and they're going to recognize they didn't make the decision they need to make. It wasn't necessarily they were bad people, wicked or evil people. They, they, were, just, they were just foolish. It's a little bit, bit like hearing someone has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And you go to them and say, well, I'm sorry to hear about your disease. What is it like to know that you're terminal? That you're you're probably not going to survive this. That person has very much the right to look at you and say, well, you need to understand that you're terminal too. You may not die from what is apparently going to take my life, but we're all terminal. This is not meant to last forever. Our lives are not going to go on forever. They're not. In all due respect, we're all terminal. Everybody on our prayer list that we have at our churches, if God heals them of what they're battling right now, those who are sick and afflicted have 
and I'm not trying to make light of anybody's battle with cancer or whatever it is, dementia. But every single person on that list, if they're healed, eventually they're still going to die unless Jesus does come back before that happens. Otherwise, they're going to die. We don't know when. And it could be today. So how do you know? How do you know if you're ready? And how do you know if you're running low on oil? Let me just mention three things that I think are indicators that you could be running low on oil and you're not prepared as you think you may be. You know you're running low on oil if you start running low on grace. And so with our eyes on eternity, we recognize that the grace that we've received in Jesus Christ and we have eternal life and we should be the most grace giving people on the planet to others. The more we recognize that we've been saved, that heaven is our home, that Jesus made it so that every single sin is forgiven and cleansed and gone, the more gracious we should be. And so if you start running low on grace for other people, it's a pretty good indication that your oil is running a little bit low. I see Christians who kind of get caught up in this low grace approach. They're not ready to light the way for the groom. Instead, they're kind of become content in darkness to fight with one another. They've kind of got caught up in this tribal approach to our times that if you don't agree with me, don't see things the way I see them, if we just don't agree that somehow we're automatically enemies and that we forget about what the Bible says about blessing others and praying for our enemies. And so we end up taking this cancel culture approach and sometimes it's in the church. The church would be the last place where we have this spirit where somebody has says something or does something and we just write them off and say, well, I'm done with them. That's it. That's not part of the gospel. The more we understand the gift of grace that we've experienced and our promise to heaven, the more gracious we should be. And you know where you run low of oil when you find yourself running low on joy. In First Thessalonians, Paul kind of closes his short letter to the Thessalonians there, Christians who are suffering, talks about the return of Jesus to them in chapter 4 and 5. And then he concludes it this way, verses 16, 17, and 18. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Three very short verses. So always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This should mark who you are as a disciple of Jesus. I know things are difficult. Things are trying. Things are hard. But we have this, this promise that gives us joy that no matter what else happens, is a joy that can't be shaken. And that joy is one of the most contagious things that attracts other people to Jesus. And then number three, I would say, you know you're running low on oil in your lamp if you find yourself running low on hope. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to serve at a church, one of our deacons in this church, in southwest Missouri, was named Paul. Paul was quite a servant. But he had an adult son named Daryl, who was in his early 20s. He had a girlfriend named Angela. And Daryl and Angela were expecting the baby. They were not married, but they, Angela was pregnant. And they started coming to church. And it was a lively atmosphere, a joyous worship experience that we had. And then Angela's parents, Larry and Beverly, started coming too. And within a few weeks, I had the opportunity to sit down with the four of them in, in Larry and Beverly's home and teach them through a series of studies called the Peace Treaty with God. And I had the opportunity to baptize the four of them. And, and Angela was extremely pregnant, nine months pregnant. Um, I've never baptized anybody who was that pregnant. And it was a thrilling experience to see those four come to Christ and then a few days later to do the wedding for Daryl and Angela in, um, in Larry and Beverly's home, the bride's home, uh, parents' home. Now Larry, even at that time, when I first met him, was battling kidney failure for several years. He was on dialysis, endured it for years. And late in his life, there was an episode where it appeared that it was going to get, get him and he was not going to survive it. 
and we're talking about you know a couple of decades and I was told we wrote a couple of notes one that said I love you all and then another one that said not afraid not afraid just two words but see that's the difference that preparation and readiness makes we can face our final moments with excitement not with fear C.S. Lewis talked about how one day in eternity, he wrote, all the pain and suffering in this world would be remembered as a little bit more than just a bad night's sleep in a cheap hotel. And C.S. Lewis knew a lot about pain and, and grief and suffering, but he understood that one day in heaven, we'd see everything completely different. Like one night's bad sleep in a cheap hotel. Our, all of our existence here on earth. So what's our role then? Our role is to make sure our lamps are filled with oil and we spend our days preparing for the groom to return for his bride. That's our role. That's the mission that we have to be to recognize we're closer now than we ever have been to Jesus' return. It's going to happen. And we look around, we see, and we hear. The call is getting closer. The bridegroom is preparing to come. And it's our job now more than ever, to light our lamps, to shine a bright light as the groom comes for the bride. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave his disciples what we call the Great Commissions, recorded in all four Gospels and also in Acts chapter 1. He said, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. It's been given to me. And so go into all the world, make disciples of every nation, and to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then to continue to teach them and he said, I will be with you forever as you do that. I'll go with you. And we have never been closer to seeing that fulfilled. In Matthew 24, Jesus connects the time, listen, that connects the timing of his return to the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Matthew 24, 14. He told his disciples the gospel where he preached to the whole world and all to all the nations, and then the end would come. And that should get our attention because in this day and time, more than ever before, we're closer to seeing that fulfilled. Back about year 2000, 23, 24 years ago, it was estimated there was about 3,500 people groups who had never heard the gospel. 3,500 people groups. Where there was 2% or less who were Christians. That's a lot. That's many millions of people. Billions of people who didn't have the Bible in their language, or perhaps the Jesus film in their language, or other Christian resources. By 2017, that number was down to about 2,000 people groups. And I've, I've read in 2024 that number of people groups who haven't heard the gospel is shrinking rapidly. And at the pace we're at, it's very likely that all the people groups of the world will have the gospel in their language by the end of this decade of the 2020s. That's how close we are and how quickly we are to seeing this fulfilled. And so our church is blessed to support Good News Productions International. They are on the front lines of getting the gospel into different languages to help all the people groups of the world to hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Sheila and I have supported them uh, for a number of years as well. As a church, together, you should know you're giving here, Park Street Christian Church, through the church. We're focused on making sure that mission, that every nation, every people group is reached with the gospel. So we light our lamps. We prepare for the groom to come and recognize that this week, God is going to give you opportunities. He'll give you resources where you can help make ready the world for the return of Jesus. You're going to see that in conversations you have and find out natural decisions that you make. You're going to have the opportunity to help shine your lamp to light the darkness. As citizens of the United States, we have an election coming up in a few months in November. November 5th, I think, is election day this year. When you can vote, the opportunity God's given us in our democratic republic to impact the world, to be salt and light. One of the most practical ways that we can be obedient to what God's called us to do. A day for us to say, look, my faith isn't just a drawer in the dresser of my life. Um, works like the faith drawer or my politics drawer or my personal relationships drawer, my financial drawer. No, faith is the dresser that all my drawers fit into 
I'm going to see that every decision I make is made through the lens of eternity. And God's going to give every one of us opportunities as long as there's life, there's breath, there's hope to make a way for the groom to come. Now today in our church service, we're passing out these little wristbands that simply say on it, Jesus is coming soon. And then it says on the other side, ask the question, are you ready? Are you ready? It's just a thin wristband like I have on my wrist. Okay. So we're just going to ask people to wear those coming weeks as a reminder because it's easy to leave a church service or turn off our computer, walk away and forget and get busy with other stuff. But this is a way to remind ourselves that life is short. Think of this black band as your as your existence on earth. Your whole life is caught up in this black wristband. Every decision you make, every financial decision you make, every relationship you have, every word you speak, every vote that you cast, everything is captured in this little band. And then ask yourself, am I ready for eternity? How foolish it is when we lose sight of that, where we live just for this breath, just for this moment, when in reality, there's all of eternity to look forward to. The whole purpose of this life is to prepare for the next that's not going to end. The whole purpose of our existence here is to prepare for eternity. And so we ask ourselves these questions, am I ready? So I just want to ask you to ask yourself some questions that maybe you should have been for years. Questions like, what impact am I having with my life? Questions like, what decision am I putting off that I really need to make? Am I right with God? Am I ready for eternity? Have I confessed my sins to the Lord? and admitted to him what he says about them are right and I'm wrong. Have I confessed from my mouth that Jesus is, I'm yielding to him as my Lord and Savior? Have I been immersed into Christ, surrendered my life to him? So I just want you to ask yourself whatever questions that you need to, the most important questions that can be asked, that you'll ever ask and answer, am I ready? Now in our church service, We're going to be looking at a rope. And the rope is going to represent eternity. And the black tape just represents the approximate width of that wristband. It represents our life. And I read in the U.S. Bureau of Statistics that the average lifespan in America for men in 2023 was 81.6 years. And for women, it was 85 years. Average lifespan in America for men in 2023, 81.6 years for women, 85 years. Okay, that's represented by that piece of tape on this rope that runs out the door of our church building down the driveway to the street, to Park Street. It goes up and hits the intersection at Highway 54, and it goes left and it goes out of El Dorado Springs, Missouri, to the other side. It goes all the way 18 miles to Nevada, Missouri. And on 54, that rope continues to go westward till it crosses over the Kansas line to Fort Scott, Kansas. But it doesn't stop there. It keeps going on Highway 54 all the way over to the south edge of Wichita. And then it goes all the way across the state of Kansas. And then it crosses the state of Colorado through the Rockies and into the southern part of Utah, and then to Nevada, and then into California, and then it is dragged across the Pacific Ocean, and it goes all the way around the world, this rope. Stretched out around the world, representing my 81.6 years compared to this rope representing eternity. And yet it goes around the world, not just around through the ocean over to Europe or China and through Southeast Asia and then Europe. And, and then it hits the Atlantic Ocean. It comes back around the United States, the East Coast. And it comes through the Appalachians and stretches out through Kentucky into Indiana and then Illinois and Missouri. It comes back to El Dorado Springs, Missouri again. And then it repeats the process. And it just keeps circling this globe 
That's what our life in eternity can be pictured at. And yet our life on earth is just that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you have planned for us for eternity. And I know that's a faulty example, but maybe it helps us get a little glimpse of what our life here on earth is like compared to eternity. So would you help us to make the decisions we need to make? And I pray if there's one listening, watching today, they'll take the time to, to contact me if we're not familiar with each other, that we could develop a, a relationship, a friendship, and I could help them with any question they might have. That we'd ask ourselves some very serious questions. Thank you for the opportunity your word gives us to be ready for the groom's return. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And again, I'll give you my phone number. 660 is area code 342-3068. That's area code 660-342-3068. You reach out to me. We're not acquainted with each other. I'll be glad to, to respond. We can exchange texts and then perhaps emails and maybe phone calls and go from there and have an opportunity to get to know one another. Perhaps I can help you in some way with a spiritual need. I'd be thrilled to do that. So thank you for this opportunity to share together with you through this message, How Can I Be Ready?